Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Alexander, president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We are delighted to have you with us tonight for this conversation about the urgent issue of monuments, memorials, and other forms of public commemoration in the United States. We've invited three of the foremost thinkers on this topic to join me in conversation tonight. And I am so excited to be talking with Natasha Trethewey, David Blight, and Brent Staples. These are three brilliant, esteemed, inimitable writers and scholars who in their work are tackling the most pressing questions of public memory, historical reckoning, and redress, and so much more. Through our work in higher education and conservation and preservation and in the fields of libraries and archives, the Andrew Mellon Foundation has long been concerned with questions of our shared historical record. Whose stories get remembered? Who tells these stories? What stories have not been told? And what implications are there for our present in how we tell these stories and for whom? Throughout this past summer, in the wake of the police murders of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Tony McDade, Elijah McClain, et cetera, et cetera, communities across the United States have been asking these very same questions, loudly demanding the removal from public space, many monuments, memorials, and historical markers that venerate heroes of the Confederacy as well as memorial statuary honoring perpetrators of colonial, racist, and gender-based violence. At least 50 monuments to the Confederacy, I think possibly many more actually, have been toppled by activists or removed by city officials just since the end of May. Statues of Christopher Columbus have been taken down in cities across the United States, including San Antonio, Philadelphia, Chicago, and New Haven. And this is not accounting for the ongoing work of public storytelling, of erecting, of revisionism that is also happening as we speak. So it is in these joint contexts that we gather this evening to consider concerns of historical memory, power, and our shared public landscape. What is at stake? Why have we invested so much in these symbols as a nation, a complicated nation? And how can we think together, not only about what to do about statues that may offend or carry a history that is violent, that we have inherited, but how also to creatively reimagine and rebuild new commemorative spaces that celebrate and affirm the historical contributions of a wide range of people and communities. Since you can see us, but we cannot see you, we would love to know who you are, where you're from, and why you're excited to be part of our discussion. So there is a chat section that we hope will be lively. If you could say hi in the comments, we'd be most grateful. And in short order, we'll begin our conversation, but first I would like to briefly introduce our three exceptional panelists, all of whom are, 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 are great thinkers and people who I think with in, in, in many ways and people for whom I have so much respect and affection. So I also just want to say uh, thank you, friends. Natasha Trethewey is a poet, a writer, and professor of English at Northwestern University. She served two terms as our country's United States Poet Laureate, the 19th. And her many honors include a Pulitzer Prize, a Heinz Award in the Arts and Humanities, and an Academy of, um, of Arts Poets Fellowship. And there are many, many more. Her most recent books include the just released memoir, Memorial Drive, and the National Book Award long-listed collection of poems entitled Monument, Natasha Trethway. David Blight is a teacher, a scholar, and a public historian by his own description at Yale University, where he is the Sterling Professor of History. In addition to several other honors, his 2018 biography of Frederick Douglass, you have not read a biography of any human being, 
until you have read David Blight's biography of Frederick Douglass, won the Pulitzer Prize, the Francis Parkman Prize, and the Bancroft Prize. He is a leading expert on abolitionism, American historical memory, and African-American intellectual and cultural history. His writing has appeared in national newspapers, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times. Brent Staples has been a member of the New York Times editorial board for 30 years. In 2019, he won a Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing in recognition of his powerful work interrogating our nation's narratives about race, including crucial work about the women's suffrage movement's racism, documented news publishers' complicity in lynchings in the South, and myths about crack babies. That's just a, a, a sprinkling. And he is also the author of the award-winning memoir, Parallel Time. So those are our guests. Before meeting this evening, we asked each of our panelists to think about one monument or memorial that they find important, whether it is exemplary, problematic, or has another significance they would like to share with us to begin our conversation. And we will first hear from Natasha Trethway. Confederacy all around me. I'm a native of Mississippi, born on Confederate Memorial Day, exactly 100 years after it was first celebrated. And my home state is full of them. Obelisks, standing soldiers, plaques, the names of roads, bridges, buildings, the former state flag, my birthday. A landscape overwritten with the narrative of the lost cause and white supremacy. The bedrock from which these ma monuments were quarried, upon which they are built. Still, the onslaught of those monuments collectively doesn't come close to the feeling I get from the hulk of ball granite that is Stone Mountain, upon which is carved the nation's largest monument to the Confederacy. I moved to Atlanta in 1972, the year the monument received its finishing touches and was finally completed. From Atlanta, a road called Memorial Drive gets you there, a lasting metaphor for the white mind of the South Stone Mountain rises out of the ground like the head of a submerged giant, the nostalgic dream of Southern heroism and gallantry emblazoned on its brow. In bas-relief, the enormous figures of Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, and Stonewall Jackson. It's emblematic of how we choose to remember what gets inscribed on the physical landscape, literally graven in stone, and on the landscape of the collective American psyche, often is calcified and unyielding, such that only something akin to the explosiveness of dynamite could change the perception of it. Imagine how different Americans' grasp of our shared history would be if instead the landscape were inscribed everywhere with monuments to the nearly 200,000 African American soldiers who fought in the Civil War for their own freedom and to preserve the Union rather than to destroy it and maintain slavery and white supremacy as Confederates did. Work on the design of the monument began in 1915, the same year that Birth of a Nation came out, and the mountaintop served as a site of the reinvention of the KKK, a giant flaming cross at its summit. And it took years to finish, and the first time it opened was in the mid-60s, in the midst of recent advancements in the civil rights movement. The supporters of the monument, including the governor, intended that it would stand as a symbol of the maintenance of white supremacy in opposition to black rights. It loomed above us, even when we couldn't see it, the way one doesn't need to see burning crosses or clan hoods to know that racism and white supremacy are a constant presence in the lives of black Americans. It represents our national wounds, its imagery and ongoing figurative violence, and in its shadow, the site of a personal wound for me as well. Thank you, Natasha. And now, David. Uh, well, thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks to the Mellon Foundation for doing this. And Natasha, thank you for that. Hardly surprising, but what you just did was prose poetry. Uh, hardly surprising. That was beautiful. Um, my choice is the Shaw Memorial in Boston, uh, sometimes called the Shaw 54th Massachusetts uh, Monument. 
Uh, the artist uh, was Augustus St. Gaudens, uh, probably America's uh, greatest public sculptor of the 19th century, maybe one of our greatest ever. Uh, born abroad, uh, grew up in New York City, uh, got fellowships as a, as a kid. He, he was a prodigy. I mean, he was a prodigy. Uh, he got fellowships to go to uh, both Paris and Rome, where he studied the great bas-relief uh, sculptures of those cultures and civilizations, especially military monuments. But what he depicts here, of course, is the march of Colonel Robert Gould Shaw in the 54th Massachusetts down Beacon Street in May of 1863. This is the famous uh, black regiment formed by the state of Massachusetts in the spring and early summer of 1863, after the Emancipation Proclamation, when the recruiting of black soldiers became a purpose of this war. Um, St. Gaudens was trying to capture here literally a single moment in time. But what makes this monument so special are really two things. It is, first of all, a magnificent work of art. And if we could get inside the monument with other kinds of photographs, I would show you the ways. Uh, it is also, though, and the second reason is that it tells a story. It tells a narrative. And that narrative is the narrative of emancipation. Those soldiers behind Robert Gould Shaw on horseback are marching southward. They are marching, about half of them, to their deaths on Morris Island around Charleston Harbor uh, on July 18th in the Battle of Fort Wagner. Um, it, it is a monument that almost breathes, as William James said in his unveiling speech. He said, you can almost hear the bronze Negroes breathe. I wanted to choose this not only because I love this monument, I think it's the greatest Civil War monument of all, but it is a monument unlike so many other generic Civil War monuments, whether they're obelisks or the lone soldier standing leaning on his musket and, 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 and uh, musing through his sideburns, as Robert Lowell said, <laughs> this mm -hmm. monument is different because it tells a great story. And it's the story that it's the heart of the very meaning of the Civil War. Thank you, David. Brent? Hi. The monument that on my mind um, these days was taken down before, uh, before Christmas, just before Christmas in 2018. It's, it was a towering monument of the Confederate General William Bedford, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, and the thing about Forrest, uh, the Forrest Monument, is that it in fact typifies the whole Confederate monument movement uh, between the, uh, the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, they basically deified people who were titans of white supremacy. Um, Forrest was in fact um, a Confederate general who presided over the massacre of mainly black troops at Fort Pillow in the Civil War. It was one of the big events um, that caused friction between the two sides as the war came to a conclusion. Uh, also, after he left um, the military, he became the first grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. Many apologists have tried to excuse that by saying it was a misjudgment and he later changed his mind. But in fact, what he did was by lending his name to the Ku Klux Klan, he transformed a ragtag group of boys clubs into a coherent imposing uh, organization that is still known for racial terror in the country to this day. Uh, and if you look at the letters of um, the women in Memphis, Tennessee, um, you can see that after the war, uh, Forrest used to, he used to trade, used to parade his Klansmen through the city on election day to intimidate black people out of going to the polls. And this monument was being considered um, at about the time that Ida B. Wells herself was being run 
out of Memphis for her anti-lynching campaign. Mm. So it is redolent of history in many, many ways. Redolent of many, many ways. And we have many um, Americans today who say, well, these, are, these monuments are, you know, are celebrating the Civil War. But what in fact we see is that in, in instance after instance, they be, were erected as part of a campaign of racial terror to keep Negroes in their place and to keep them fearful and to basically appropriate public spaces for white supremacy at a time, as I've often said in my essays, when Negroes were non-persons in the eyes of the state. Mm -hmm. If we flash forward to 2018, we see Memphis is becoming a majority black city. And this towering figure of this terrorist, racial terrorist, is presiding over a city park. Mm. And so year upon year upon year, people have to walk around under it and, and sort of... Um, and be subject to it. Mm -hmm. So the city council, in its wisdom, voted to rename three parks. In earlier in the decade, they voted, they voted to rename three parks that were named for Confederate um, figures. And they had this moved out of the park before Christmas in 2018. Um, so I think this, the arc of this monument's existence show, it, you know, sort of typifies how these things were created as, as part of the campaign to intimidate and subjugate black people, and how they began to be reconsidered as black persons became persons in the eyes of the state mm -hmm. and got the right to vote and had finally a voice about this. So, you know, this is the one that's on my mind most times when I think about the recent campaign and the, the recent uprising against Confederate monuments. Thank you so much. I have um, I have many questions, but I, I I wonder as I've watched you listening, do you have questions or comments for each other about uh, about what you just heard and saw? Well, I have just a comment, and that is that uh, we, we we didn't discuss with each other which monuments we would choose, but but the way this works out is. Uh, we are really uh, delivering a blow here to the lost cause. Uh, we're putting <laughs> uh, the lost the lost cause is teetering, and we're trying to push it over. <laughs> and it's and it's high time. As an ideology, it is high time. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And I I was just thinking that um, after listening to Brent too, that um, there is a, a a county in Mississippi uh, called Forest County that was. Um, renamed, it was not originally named Forest County, but was renamed Forest County um, in honor of Nathan Bedford Forrest and white supremacy. And it's just, um, you know, I, I live on Forest Avenue uh, in, in Chicago, and it's only got one R in it. But anytime I'm in correspondence with people in Mississippi, they write to me and they put two R's and I get really upset mm. because it's like I'm receiving a monument again and again mm -hmm. through the name written on mail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you in, yes. Well, I, it's, I can, uh, I was looking recently um, into the um, Stone Mountain Monument. And uh, I have some researchers sifting around for um, data on who funded it. Mm. Mm. And uh, when this is known, um, what you will find is that it, it was the same people who were the Rotarians, you know, um, mm -hmm. and the sort of the sort of the people who wanted a place in the civic sphere who wanted to prove their bona fides as, as good civic people were contributing to that monument. And at some point or another, um, those details are going to come out and you're going to see a lot of people who, were, uh, who we don't identify with the Confederate mm -hmm. cause signed on to it in that way. Wow, uh, wow, wow. And so that, I mean, those, that information is, is just coming. Mm -hmm. And the same artist as who did uh, Mount Rushmore. Mm 
Oh, really? He's the one who started it, I think, but not yeah. finished it, maybe. That's true, mm-hmm. but he was involved yeah. in both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, could I just add one little Please. thing? Please. Um, I looked up, the, in, prep, in preparation for this, I sort of looked up in the Times archive, and I've been writing about Confederate monuments for 20 years on the wow. other page in one way or another. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they're tied into... Um, they're tied into the whole business of the Confederate flag being an emblem of the state um, and being an emblem of the Southern state. So yes, you know, recently was just removed from the Mississippi state flag, the Confederate inset was taken out, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, that was a consequence of money, of course, because uh, the basic NAAC, I mean, the NCAA said, we can't abide by this any longer. We'll have to hold our football championships elsewhere if you can't do something about this. So, but mm-hmm. black lawmakers in Mississippi have been agitating for this forever. Mm. Forever. Yep. But, you know, just in parallel, when we had the Charleston Massacre, it took the Charleston Massacre to get the Confederate, Confederate battle flag taken down at the South Carolina Capitol. And I remember... Uh, going over this at that time and going over kind of the pedigree of that and how it happened. Uh, and basically, the, f- the Confederate flag was displayed in the South Carolina House in 1938 after angry Southerners in Congress defeated a bill that would have made lynching a federal crime. So it appears there at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the flag was quietly moved to a position of pride on the dome of the Capitol in 1962 after John F. Kennedy called on Congress to end poll taxes and literacy, literacy tests for voters. Right. Uh, and by that time, of course, uh, it became, uh, you know, uh, was closely associated with racial terrorism. And then it, be, you know, th- another signal event and the flying of the flag. Um, was um, the Supreme Court striking down um, segregation of public conveyances. So the flag in South Carolina, it recapitulates the thing I was talking about. It it recapitulates in the mid-20th century the same thing. uh, Because in the 1890s, these monuments went up as testaments to the Confederacy, as testaments to the Lost Clause, as testaments to slavery. And even if we go through the states, we see in the 1960s, variously, uh, as civil rights gains are being made, the flag and monuments are being elevated and kind of rebuttal. And so people who think of these things as innocuous Southern tradition are you know, it's, it's understandable they think that because they walk around and they've lived with them forever. But if you go back into the history of the things, they were advanced, moved forward as in, to buttress segregation, to buttress the rejection of civil rights. And Brent. Well, and I think, go, oh, please, go ahead, David. Well, l- lest we forget, unfortunately, violence seems to always be part of this story. You mentioned Charleston, there's no question. We're in a five-year period now, begun by the Charleston massacre and then punctuated by Charlottesville, another killing, another death. And then now, uh, George Floyd and many other killings this spring and summer that has led to this phenomenal outpouring of disdain for all things Confederate. Uh, And one last little point here. You know, those those uh, legislators, those Republican legislators in South Carolina who voted to take down their flag at their governor, Nikki Haley's behest, voted right away the next week to pass a voter ID law. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, we can give them some credit for finally waking up in the face of a mass murder, but they didn't stop voter suppression. Mm-hmm. So I think where, where you all have taken us is is to a something I wanted to ask about, a historicizing of this moment. Uh, and David, you're giving us, uh, you know, a five year window. Um, but as we think about these uh, monuments and also as we think about the many of them purport to tell history, but are often frequently not erected in real time. 
So, uh, you know, I think that, that sometimes people read them as the present as being out of the time that they reference. But actually, so many of them were erected later on yes. in order to say something, do something, uh, inculcate something. Uh, you know, so wh wh why is a stone mountain only getting finished in the 1960s, mm -hmm. uh, re referencing something that happened 100 years ago? Um, so I wonder, as we think about um, the function of, of monuments and memorials um, in this particular moment, do you feel, maybe starting with mm -hmm. Natasha, that we are, uh, you know, in a nation building, nation creating identity contestation moment akin to, you know, David, you've talked about Germany in 1989. Uh, uh, is this, is, are we here now? Uh, and what does this monuments issue uh, tell us about the moment that we're in? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, I hear a lot of uh, of the the voices out there who say that uh, if we get rid of these monuments, that what we're doing is erasing history. And the problem with these monuments is that they already erase history. They've mm -hmm. already erased by inscribing these narratives of white supremacy. They've already erased, uh, and the way that people think of them is, is instead about heritage rather than hate, for example. They're already erasing the history of uh, African-American struggles, their role in the Civil War, um, the reason that these monuments were ever erected. All of that is erased by the monuments as they naturalize on the landscape white supremacy. Um, and the contest that we're having now, and the reason I think it is so important you know, it's because something that George Orwell wrote, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. So by rethinking and reimagining what is going to inscribe our landscape, there's so much power in that. It's power for where we're going to go as a country. Also, as, as our friend um, Annette Gordon-Reed has so eloquently said, uh, History is a discipline, you know, that is written and studied and keeps being revised. Um, these monuments are not history. They, they reflect the public will at a particular point in time. In terms of Confederate monuments, the big rush that came between the 1890s and 1920, that 1890s and 1920 is, of course, includes the apex of the lynching period. When Negroes in Memphis, for example, or being murdered for failing to get off the sidewalk or, or competing with white people in business. So we can't separate those two. Um, so the idea that they somehow constitute history um, is, sort of, is sort of fallacious and absurd. You know, what except, they do, go ahead. Except that they are history in the sense that even they get revised. Mm -hmm. Monuments, mm -hmm. though they appear permanent and they're in granite and bronze and all the <clears> rest are not necessarily ever permanent. I mean, uh, one of the first set of monuments we know about is when Moses told the Israelites to put up memory stones along the way through their epic great journey. We can't find them today, right. but we right. believe they were there. Uh, monuments are always being revised sometimes, but you're quite right, everyone's right here about the question of power. Uh, Collective memory is always about the politics of memory. Who gets to determine the narrative? Who gets to control the story at the end of the day? Are we at some unusual moment, Elizabeth? I do think we are. I have no idea where we're going. I did write that speculative piece, uh, wherever it was, uh, The New Yorker, I think, mm -hmm. on, on, on wondering if this is a 1989, in the sense that communism as an ideology had truly just run amok. Right, uh -huh. It was wearing out. It wasn't working anymore. It was falling to pieces. And it was tipped over. Mm -hmm. And an epic change in world history occurred. I think we can hope, at least, and there's some evidence for this, that the lost cause ideology, and all that goes into that, the lost cause really is a whole set of arguments at the core of its white supremacy than a whole other set of historical arguments. Is it possible 
that we are at that kind of 1989 moment in which the lost cause is being crushed. Mm -hmm. Maybe not entirely. Uh, nothing has ever gone entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, but it could be. Uh, as an ideology, as a system of thinking, as a version of American history. Even if uh, 500 of these Confederate monuments survive this process, here and there, and towns and corners of cities and wherever, um, I think the lost cause is on the run, I hope. Well, I would and I'm say, not I, only very hopeful about these things. I think of it slightly differently. I think of it in terms of a century. I think of it, uh, I am uh, the great-grandson of a man named John Wesley Staples, who narrowly missed being born a slave. Born, he was conceived during the Civil War, born July 4th, 1865. Mm. Um, he was born into a family his mother was enslaved. His older siblings were enslaved in southwestern Virginia. And he died just 10 years before I was born. So a mm. guy and my uncles, who were recently passed away, my uncle you know, passed away like 10 years ago at the age of 97, you know, sat at the breakfast table with people who had been born in chains. Mm -hmm. So that's what animates me. But <clears throat> I think of it in terms of Book ending 1920 with 2020. Mm. I mean, the struggle of Negroes at the time, uh, to, uh, the, at, you know, basically we have Woodrow Wilson coming in, segregating the, the federal government in Washington, destroying the black middle class, you know. And Negroes basically still having lynching problems. You have, you have uh, the, the Tulsa race massacre a year after. Uh, you have several several. You have the Elaine um, Arkansas massacre. We still don't know how many people were buried who were killed there. So between 1920, sort of the nadir for black people, and 2020, we're at the moment, um, and I've yet to write this, but we're at the moment for the first time in sort of the public, in the media history, we have a broad ar array of black people and so who, who I sometimes call Negroes, who in fact have a kind of power that black people never had before in America, in all kinds of forum, right? And so this, the question of these monuments is being considered also in the light of the fact that there are a lot of black people participating in a forum where historically they could not. So, so let me th and so let me ask two big big questions. Um, one is we've been talking about monuments assuming stone and bronze for the most part, but when you mention those tablets, David, uh, you know it brings up the question of the ephemeral. When we talk about Charleston, uh, to me, uh, uh, the most powerful. Uh, monument that came out of that was the artist and activist Bree Newsom mm -hmm. taking down the flag. Mm -hmm. That's the to, to me. That's that's at that moment is an ephemeral uh, monument. I think about um, uh, about poetry and literature and Natasha uh, about so many of your poems, but um, particularly the poem where you speak about being a child in a classroom, being taught the book Gone with the Wind as history. Uh, that's another kind of monumentalizing. Um, so, so one question is, how do we think about um, about other ways that memorializing happens? Maybe we think it's not as important as as stone and bronze, but but let's explore that. And then also, um, you know, when we when we talk about teaching the monument, teaching history, not destroying historical artifacts, how do you balance that? with the pain and dehumanization that comes from living in the shadow um, uh, of uh, these uh, stone and flesh ideologies. And maybe, Natasha, you could start us off. Yeah, um, thanks, Elizabeth. You know, um, well, for, for one thing, I do want to say also to David's point that um, as hopeful as I am that we've got the lost cause on the run, what I'm worried about is that um, you know, once the visible symbols of white supremacy come mm. down, mm -hmm. uh, how else will it be made manifest? I mean, David, mm -hmm. you mentioned, you know, not supporting Voting Rights Act. I mean, so you can yeah. take down a symbol, but then find yeah. another way to yeah. 
to do the same thing. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I do worry about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think my whole project uh, is is connected to growing up with all these monuments and particularly in the shadow of Stone Mountain. Mm -hmm. And that has been to create a a lyrical monument in words, in poetry that can stand up against these things in stone and bronze, uh, to create monuments uh, where there had been none erected, for whom none had been erected. And the the hardest thing for me, I mean, and the reason that Stone Mountain is not just this, you know, as I mentioned, sort of the the ongoing, you know, metaphor of the white mind of the South and, and white mm-hmm. supremacy, it mm-hmm. also suggests to me, because it is so big and looming over our small individual lives, mm-hmm. my mother was killed at the base of that mountain. Mm-hmm. And so to me, when I put those two things side by side, I see the very small personal trauma, a, a small personal violence. Mm-hmm against a large domestic violence Mm -hmm. that is the civil war and that is our nation's uh, largest wound. Um, And yet what gets remembered about that is white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what is not remembered there is the tiny life, which was my mother's. Mm -hmm. I've sought to reverse that, to place her story higher and uh, larger than what that monument means. Amen. You know, yeah, amen indeed. You know, I, I've always loved that line, and I used it in the title of one of my books on Civil War memory from Robert Penn Warren, where he said the American Civil War is our oracle, yeah. darkly unriddled and portentous of personal as well as national fate. But I always I try to reflect out loud with audiences on that about but, but where is this oracle? Does it, does it have to be a place? Mm-hmm. Does it have to be mm-hmm. a monument? Does it have to be in stone? And I've often said, maybe it's in a line from a Walt Whitman poem. Maybe it's now in a line from one of your poems, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe it's a, it's a piece of prose by Lincoln or Douglas. You know, our oracle, where we go to ask, who are we? What are we? And last a little point here to this question, Elizabeth. I did another op-ed recently where I just reflected on how, well, I I politicized it. I said the Biden campaign should put together a national task force on memorialization, not just monuments, but the whole idea of memorialization coming out of this, this period right now. And based in part on the WPA model, but not entirely, but to inspire local creative thinking about how to memorialize communities, how to memorialize neighborhoods, uh, how to memorialize local people, stories. And maybe monuments no longer have to be bronze and stone. Maybe they can be about events. Maybe they can be about ideas. And maybe they become a process. Maybe they become an organization that becomes itself a kind of memorialization. I think the 21st century... You know, like the 20th century got away from equestrian statues, for God's sake. You know, in the 19th century, everything had to be equestrian. (laughs) So in the 21st century, maybe just maybe, we might get beyond even the most creative and beautiful forms of stone and bronze into other kinds of thinking, creative thinking about memorialization. This country has an incredibly diverse, rich multitudinous, conflicted history. Let's let a thousand flowers bloom and figure out how we want to memorialize that. Even if it's, even if it's messy and conflicted, but that's what democracy is. We're seeing some uh, changes in the modus operandi of memorializers. And oh yeah, women, it's happening all over the place. In the women's, suff- the women's suffrage movement, uh, yeah. the centennial of the 19th Amendment, for example, mm-hmm. um, also, Going back to Memphis, I'm eager to get to Memphis to see the Memphis Suffrage Memorial, which has um, Ida B. Wells, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mary Church, Mary Church Terry, has the the it's I racially think... mixed memorial of figures. So you you froze a little bit, Brent, but I think you're okay now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We missed. 
Um, well, you know, I'm going to turn now to, we've got a lot of questions from, um, from the audience. And so I'm going to turn to some of these questions. Um, after a monument is removed, where should it go? Should it be destroyed or displayed within a museum as an artifact of our history? That comes from Frank Mercurio. And I think we can also imagine many other things that could be done with uh, monuments if we felt they should no longer be in the space where they are. Well, first of all, they can't all go in museums. If, if you talk, <laughs> talk to museum people, uh, they're, they're, <laughs> they're not willing to give up entire wings of their buildings to, to old monuments. Uh, and I've been on panels in various museums where they will tell you that. Uh, I don't, you know, there's the Russian model where they created uh, Stalin Park. <laughs> uh, and just dumped all these, and now they've made them into a kind of special place of of the leftover Stalin monuments or even Lenin monuments. Is mm -hmm. that's a possibility? Um, sometimes they probably will be destroyed. Uh, some they already have been in some instances. Uh, th th this is a question, though, that is usually local. Just like taking down a monument, or for that matter, even creating a monument, has local roots and local origins. Uh, I don't know what New Orleans did, Natasha, with... They you know, put them in storage. Well, that big, storage. that big Lee monument is in storage. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, they had to do something with it because it was, you know, they were under such threat. Mm -hmm. But eventually, uh, maybe you display some of them as artifacts of the past, uh, but but maybe not. Um I don't I think know. Some of them go to graveyards. I think yes. the one that that yes, came down are. at Ole Miss uh, might have gone mm -hmm. to the cemetery. I mean, that's kind yeah. of where they belong. Um, <laughs> I don't think many people have a problem with you putting a monument over a person's grave if you want to honor the memory of the person. Mm -hmm. So that does seem like one of the places. I, you know, the questions that I that I find so difficult to think about are about Stone Mountain, though, because there yeah. it is, yeah. that huge thing. You know, what do you do with it? And you you know, I, I kind of have mixed feelings about it because, yeah. um, you know, on the one hand, I think, you know, if we were if we we're able to contextualize these monuments and really tell a fuller version mm -hmm. of the story about mm -hmm. why they're there, how they got erected, if people knew that, it, it's a moment to educate, you know, Americans about our collective history. On the other hand, um, you could sandblast it. Uh, not replace it with something else, but just leave it as a scar. Mm, I think the scar mm. itself would provoke mm. questions that could help us answer mm -hmm. what was there, why it was there, why it's no longer there. Yeah, also, that, go ahead, Brent. Go, no, I just that Stone Mountain. I, I agree with you. It's sui generis, right? It's there's nothing quite like it mm -hmm. in the whole oeuvre of. Uh, Confederate memorialization, and that, that's a very powerful idea. Go ahead, Dave. No, I was just going to say, too, though, as a historian here, I'll just take, you know, half a minute and say, I, too, am worried a bit, not about any particular individual monument, although Monument Avenue in Richmond, I never thought I'd live to see it all come down. I don't think any, any of us did, mm -hmm. but, but they are, or they're being redone by artists. Anyway, I'm a little worried about the rage to remove in a particular historical moment because it inevitably, understandably, lacks any sense of humility, uh, concern, uh, uh, foresight about, so what will they say about us in 50 years, in 100 years? How will this moment be interpreted if, if we just rip up a memorial landscape and throw it in the river. I understand the impulse, mm -hmm. but do we want that to be the essential story that is written about this era? And uh, not that I can have, do much of anything to control that, but uh, you know, just like there's not much humility and in, in, there's no humility in the creation of a white supremacist monument in 1909 in a Southern town, there's also not a lot of humility in the tearing of these out of the landscape. And how we do this really matters for the future of who we say we are. But I wonder, David, do you think, I mean, what does it mean to 
move something that has instructed yeah. in non-personhood, you know, yeah. in white supremacy. I mean, that seems to me to be kind of quite, quite different from, yeah. you know, and, and I guess I wonder also um, if we think about, like I've wondered, and perhaps one of you knows the answer to this, just exactly how many Robert E. Lees are there in this country? <laughs> like, it's a serious question. I would like to know how many statues of Robert E. Lee are in this country, and I would like to know how many states they're in, and I would like to know how many states they're in where Robert E. Lee never set foot, oh, man. and I would like to know what they uh, those statues are saying and doing in communities. You see what I'm saying? So, so There's even uh, one I, in I, New York. There's even one in New York. I mean, well, and there was Robert E. Lee stained glass in the National Cathedral that oh, they yeah. chose to take out because right. they said this is a place of worship, and this right. makes no sense here. Mm -hmm. Actually, this okay. makes no sense. So, um, how do we think about um, th this? Is is not advocating for one thing or the other, but 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 how do we also think about the actual proliferation? Uh, of, of of some of these statues when we get to the question of what would it mean to take some of them down? Yeah, well, there's actually good history written on, you know, what the, the Lee mythology and, you know, the, the Marble Man mythology and all of that. Uh, but that doesn't mean people will read it. I, I mean, one can hope that in this in this historical moment we're living through, however long it lasts, this removal period of confederate memorialization that we keep a good record of it that that we record what we're doing and why that we are careful at least about um remembering and explaining how and why we're doing this that doesn't mean you know if a mob goes out and tears down a monument we should sit them down and interview them for oral history or something no no but i'm just saying you know we we want we want to create a record of this transformation, if we can. We have the historical record, it's a pretty voluminous one, of why and how these all went up. Will we have any kind of record of their coming down and replacement? Or is it possible that may just take so long and happen in so many different ways that it's not really possible to record it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, um, what I was saying earlier about if the ones that we keep somehow, if they were put in their proper context, I, I was just, mm -hmm. I don't know if this is, you know, how you do that. Do you, do you add another monument to stand beside yeah. it? Um, yeah. I was kind of thinking about the one in um, Mississippi uh, at the courthouse where um, the trials of the murderers of, of Emmett Till were yeah. held. Yeah. And how there's a Confederate monument right there, and then right next to it is a marker talking about Till yeah. and the case. Um, yeah. So you stand there and you read that, and then you look over at the Confederate monument, and mm -hmm. then you look back at the Till plaque, and maybe something happens uh, for a, a viewer encountering That's fascinating. That's actually a great point, Natasha. And there, there are lots of these cases. One quick example. On the courthouse lawn in Easton, Maryland, Talbot County, Maryland, where Frederick Douglass was held in a jail cell for two weeks after he planned an escape plot. And that courthouse is still there. There is now, it was erected about seven, eight years ago. There's a major monument of Frederick Douglass. The, you know, one of those monuments of him standing and speaking. Right next to him, well, about 20 feet away, is a Confederate monument. And it's called To the Boys of Talbot. And it has the names, it has about 25 names of white Confederates who died in that county. And I've been asked many times, because there's a whole movement now to take down that Confederate monument, and I think it is going to be taken down. I've argued, no, don't take that down. Leave it there. Let Douglas keep pointing at that monument. And the reason... <laughs> This is a personal reason. But the reason I want it left there is because Edward Covey's son is on that monument. And wow. as, as anyone who's read Douglas's narrative knows Edward Covey was the man Douglas, you know, whooped. 
<laughs> has the famous fight with him. But that's Kobe's son in that moment. I want Doug there pointing at him forever. Now, most people won't care about that, I suppose. But there's a lot of learning that can go on there. You there's, take, there are and that's a conversation. That's a conversation to teach. That's the dynamism of simultaneous yeah. stories being take available to us at the same time. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Worship Douglas, you know. Brent, were you going to... Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's important to keep in uh, mind, um, once again, to, uh, to talk about Annette, talking, Annette Gordon-Reed talking about this, is these Confederate monuments, first of all, um, they, in many places, they consume public space, right? And they represent a period when persons of color were non-persons and had no voice in this memorialization. Uh, and that's number one. Number two, they represent an effort to destroy the United States of America. That's fundamental. <laughs> so so those, those, these, are, these are a different brand of memorials altogether. So in the end, you know, I, I think that I agree with uh, that something nuanced could be done with Stone Mountain as Natasha says, uh, and that some teaching could be done uh, with some of these monuments and could be instructive. Uh, but at the other end, what has to happen is all of the people, like uh, the black soldiers who fought in the Civil War, you, you both have brought that up, you know, um, where are they in the landscape? You talk about one in Boston, where are they in the landscape? You know, um, all the people, uh, the black abolitionists in New York, I mean, the whole rich tradition of black abolitionists in New York, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Ruggles, you know, mm -hmm. all those people. Why is there not, you know, there's like at least 10 of these people who should be depicted in the landscape or should be on a history trail or something. So we have we have a lot of work to do to recover, as Natasha says, lost and buried history. Um, I think also we're going to really, really need our uh, artists, um, our writers, our thinkers uh, to to help us do this in a way that's not just, you know, an earth that is groaning with a zillion new bronze statues, yeah. right. uh, but rather, you know, the ways uh, that you think about um, uh, since we've got Frederick Douglass on the on the mind uh, in the great Robert Hayden poem, Frederick Douglass, when he talks about the lives grown out of his life, mm -hmm. you know, what does it mean to make that material? Um, we've been wonderfully actually addressing a lot of the questions um, that are um, in in the the Q and A. But one zone we haven't gone into that a couple of people asked about: uh, Can I ask you how you respond to those like the smart young people I teach? who say, so we take these Confederate monuments down, so what? What are the real concrete transformations and overturning of racism in concrete terms? That's from Catherine Height at Vassar College. And then uh, Hannah Burstein asks, how might you respond to the criticism that attention to monuments takes away attention from systemic change? So I know we're here to talk about monuments tonight, but I think that's, that's an important angle. Start with I've, politics. Start with politics. Mo monuments are about politics. M memorialization has a politics. And it is the state, whether it's the nation or the states, uh, local, local governments who create these things. Uh, I do believe these issues are mingled, should be mingled. Yes, we don't want to spend all of our energy and our capital and our money on just rememorializing a different history when we need better health care and we need, uh, you know, less uh, racial disparity in a thousand different ways and we have voter suppression all around. Yes, we have to, but we can do both of those things. Yes, mm -hmm. I think we can. And it's, you know, I, I sympathize with the questioners, but it's not for nothing that all these demonstrators, um, it's not for nothing that Bree climbed that flagpole and took that flag down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you know, as King said, the arc, the moral universe is long and they may try to undo it by suppressing the vote. But, you know, symbols are very important, mm -hmm. you know, symbolic, mm -hmm. very, very important. 
And we see that the public discontent with these monuments and with the Confederate flag has caused businesses, corporations to take a different tack to these things. It's caused the NCAA, sports people to take a different tack. Um, oh, yeah. uh, it, you see now, you know, for what it's worth, the NFL putting in racism in its um, end zones, right? This is the, the sort of the antipathy toward these monuments is the beginning of a broader discussion about inequality and history. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the beginning of, a, of this discussion that's going on. And uh, it, I, hopefully it'll go on for quite some time. Yeah. Natasha? Oh, you know, I don't know that I have anything to add, but I mean, to, to both of those points, I mean, I, I'm just thinking, you know, D- David is talking about the politics of it. Um, Brent is talking about the power or the money of it. And it is the way that things begin to change. Um, who, whoever has money to erect the monuments also has the power to erect them. So all of a sudden, when the money and the power aren't following the maintenance of those things, it's going to go somewhere else. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it, I see it also, as you say, Brent, as a beginning of a long and important conversation. But it is a start to something. It's not simply a diversion. Right. It is part of the process of change. And so Elizabeth, we are Elizabeth. almost at, at, at time. I'm gonna. I'm. I, we could go on for so long, um, <laughs> but I want to just um, leave us with um, with one question um, that if you could each answer, um, if you could build a memorial or monumental space to a person or an event or an idea, what would it be? And I ask that question, noting that you've each actually done that. Uh, For one example, uh, David's Frederick Douglass biography. For a few examples, Natasha's writing on her mother and on the Native Guard uh, soldiers. Brent's essays on the Lyons family, on the black women suffragists. I mean, so so you've all all done this uh, on paper. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you could build a memorial or monumental space to a person, event, or idea, what would it be? (laughs) Well, I mean, Elizabeth, you're right. I mean, indeed, it would be my mother. And so I have to say that uh, I am engaged in building it every day. Um, As Shakespeare sonnet number three says, Thou art thy mother's glass, and she in thee calls back the lovely April of her prime. I am a living monument to my mother, and through my living, I continue to memorialize and remember her. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Wow. I've, I've been obsessed of, of the last few years. Uh, I've been obsessed with um, uh, the black suffragist movement and the erasure of those women. And as you see, I keep writing about it over and over again. Mm-hmm. Because I think there's many, many ways to explore it. Uh, but my monument to the black suffragists is being built is in Memphis. Wow. I mean, I, I mean, I didn't create it. What I'm saying is it is the one that it, it is the one, as I've seen it rendered, that captures um, my harsh desire to see uh, Mary Church Trail, Ida B. Wells and others, lesser known women brought into the, the mainstream of this representation. And as it's brought forward um, um, with holographs and everything, I think it should be quite beautiful. And this is, this is, this is my monument being actualized. Mm-hmm. And is this like a memorial space? And, and is the- t- it's, it's a memorial outside near a, court, near a, a courthouse, I think, quite expansive with holography and images of all the participants, and lists of names, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. It should be quite sensational. And in Memphis, of course, where, you know, the lynching capital, you know, yep. at one time, Nathan Bedford Forrest dominated the town for 100 years. So the, the coming forward of these lost black women, to me, is a very moving experience. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank you. David. Well, I'm going to, mine is going to be less personal. Uh, And I I found both of your statements deeply moving. Uh, Mine will be less personal and much more macro. 
I, and I need a lot of artists to help help with this. This is just my it's an idea, but the artists uh, let let let's let's start commissioning them. I want a monument to the natural rights tradition and how it trans it transformed in America in this right to vote. Where is our monument to the right to vote, mm. and where it comes from in human history? The natural rights tradition absolutely animated Frederick Douglass's mind all of his life. And, and it was in the vote that he thought it was, you know, most, most uh, importantly and visibly expressed. Now, how that gets rendered as monument or as a memorialization, I am not sure. But I want a group of artists to come together and figure out how do you commemorate the basic creeds that we believe we live by and not just you know in another monument to a jefferson or another monument <laughs> to douglas there douglas has got 12 monuments that i know of now in the united states enough already uh you know uh, uh, a monument to the most precious ideas by which we live how do we do that artists get out get ready out there i don't have any, I don't have any money yet but uh, start working on it well, th those were gorgeous answers, uh, and this was uh, a rich and thoughtful and edifying conversation that will continue with all of you who are listening, uh, will continue with us. Uh, I'm chasing right behind all of you, uh, and will certainly continue um, in our, uh, our current national conversation. So Natasha Trethway, Brent Staples, David Blight, big hearted genius, good citizens. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you. So many of you listened in. Uh, I think we had over 700 people listening in today. So to all of you who listened, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you Let's do the seminar again. David. Sometime. Yes. Let's do it. <laughs> yes. Bye-bye.